Now I've really reached the end. Flipping through the manga, Hunter Hunter is great. Look at all these new plot developments, all the Jing, the Paris, and Kurapika's back. This new story is going to be huge. And then chapter 349 comes to an end. And the story hasn't really even started. It was depressing. <laughs> Seriously. But now I have joined all of you in the hiatus for real this time. But the Dark Continent arc, the eighth arc of the wonderful story that is Hunter Hunter. The Hunter Association is reforming itself in the aftermath of the Khmer Ant arc in light of Nevero's death. Gon and Kilo are largely out of the picture right now thanks to Gon's breakdown. He's about as useless and endless as Krolo at the moment. And Kilo having freed Alika, he's finally found something of his own that he wants to do with his life. And so, he's done. Jing and Paristan have both left the Zodiacs, and Leorio and Kurapika have replaced them. And last but not least, we have an important change of events. Netero's left behind a son, who is planning on leading an expedition to the Dark Continent, the world beyond human maps. And an incredibly dangerous world that world is. Essentially all human attempts to go there in the past have ended in some sort of disaster, resulting in both the deaths or horrible conditions behind uh, the explorers and what is essentially a punishment plague to the rest of mankind. And this, this is the world that Jing Bing Jing has always desperately longed to see, and naturally he wants to take the opportunity to go. But with a lot of bickering and internal politics and all of that, it's clear it's not going to be that simple. There is a lot of exposition and information going here. A lot of it, and there's no way I could discuss all of this for time's sake. But at the end of the day, we end up with a sort of complicated uh, two-pronged expedition where loyalties are very, very unclear. In the simplest sense, we have Jean and Paris and teaming up on one side, and then Leorio and Kurapika and the Zodiacs on the other. No one's really sure whether they trust each other, especially with regards to uh, Beyond Netero, Netero's son. Yes, that's his name, Beyond. And it would be really cool to see if he actually lives up to his name. Beyond Netero, given how powerful Netero is, that would be quite an accomplishment. And I'd like to see if it really is true. We also have a bit of a wild card element with the uh, Kakin royal family. They're uh, sort of uh, orchestrating this expedition to an extent. They're very corrupt, very clearly. And this expedition is evidently them just trying to figure out which of their children is going to ascend to the throne. Most of our attention to, uh, as at this moment, has been given to the uh, fourth son, I believe, his name is Sediednich or something like that, who is painted as an absolute psychopath. Fun times, and he's also even more fun. The owner of the last of the scarlet of many of the last of the scarlet eyes the Kurapika has spent the last couple of years of his life hunting down. He and Kurapika will both be going on this expedition. So things are bound to come to a head there, and then it'll certainly be interesting to watch. But more with speculation later, because this is all we really got at the moment. The story has yet to take off at all. And so there's really not that much I can review at the moment, unless I were to go mm. into really super deep analysis, which I probably will at some point, though probably not until I read the full manga someday in the future. I can say with certainty that I really, really like Jing as a character. I did during the election arc, and I do even more now. I am strangely intrigued by Paris, and if you haven't gotten uh, the gist by now, I do really enjoy villain characters. He and Ching certainly make an interesting partnership, though I don't think that that will last. And actually, let's see whether this is true, this comes true or not. I'm kind of predicting now that Patterson is 
going to somehow, at some point, directly or indirectly, end up killing Jing. I don't believe that Jing could be a long-standing character in the series. He's simply way too powerful, which we really see in this arc. And sort of as Jing, as Gon's, sort of like that abstract, that goal that he's been reaching for for so long, his death could certainly bring about new developments in our main character. And at the end of the day, Gon, Gon's development is more important to the story than Jing's presence, as much as I love Jing. Especially with Gon just providing a means, a means for Gon to come back into the story. Moreover, Pariston is dangerous. He seems sort of fun at times and how unbelievable of a character he is. But at the end of the day, he is a character who simply gets off by messing with people, by hurting them. He is like Hisoka. He only really cares about having this fun, and Jing's death certainly has the potential to bring about chaos. Possibly on the expedition, this dangerous world that they're going to be in, their potential greatest strength against these dangerous things, and also with repercussions back in the normal world when the news spreads. I don't know whether he'll get as much like satisfaction out of killing someone he hates, but he might just want to find out. <sighs> and certainly has the potential to lead into future arcs, as I said, we've gone earlier. And it would also provide a pretty interesting parallel to Netero, who was always only interested in fun as well. And Jing said earlier that Pariston is really the only one of the Zodiacs who is really living up to the sort of hunter association that Netero wanted it to be. So, and also, just being in it for the fun of things is becoming a pretty common characteristic in Togashi's characters, Hisoka being the other prime example, and it usually doesn't come out for the better. So that could be interesting to see as sort of like a repeating theme in the story. On another note, I am so happy to see the return of Leorio and Kurapika. It's been such a long time, especially seeing them together. Like, we had some of the audio in the election arc, but it wasn't really that much, and no Kurapika at all. But it looks like we'll really be seeing both of them in action this time. And we've never really seen the audio fight at all. And he certainly will have to fight in such a dangerous situation, even if, even if he's only there for doctoring reasons. And so that'll be really interesting to see how he holds himself there. And Finally, maybe give him a chance to come into his own as a main character. It will also be very interesting to see how Kurapika conducts himself here. First of all, he'll be considerably weaker because he's not going up against spiders, against the Phantom Troop, and so his like his most dangerous, his most significant powers will he won't be able to use them. So we'll be able to see the real after effects, the real consequences of him making his restriction being limiting himself to the Phantom Troop. And I can't really see him handling Zeriednich's presence very well, for one thing. He's not going to handle that well. He almost fell apart during Phantom Troop, just because he's such a psychopath. Possession of his beloved Scarlet Eyes is not going to be pretty. And I was also sort of pleasantly surprised, on another note, by the increase in art quality that I saw here, because a lot of what I've seen of the Hunter Hunter manga wasn't really all that great. But this was consistently pretty good, by, by Hunter Hunter standards at least, and I don't know, it was nice. Hopefully when he comes back he will continue to be a strong artist. But really, the best thing that the story really has going for it at the moment is the sense of dread that is building up. Every single expedition to the Dark Continent in the past has led to disaster in varying degrees, and there's no real reason to assume that this time will be any different. Togashi has not ever shied away from showing the darker side of things, the darker side of people, and to have human curiosity, human arrogance, whatever you want to call it, backfire terribly would be completely aligned with what we've seen in the past. 
So I can actually see this arc ending with a lot of bodies on the ground. And when we consider that Meruem and the Chimera Ants were ranked a class B threat relative to this stuff, like, what does a more dangerous threat look like? Seriously. Like, what is it going to be? I don't know. But, so I think it's safe to say that if nothing else, this arc is probably going to be for Leorio and Kurapika what Khmer Ant was to Gonakiloa, and possibly even worse, especially because we're dealing with adults this time and not children. So, I am excited and a little bit scared, but mostly excited. And, but the really strange thing at the moment is that Togashi is really only expanding the story. The natural assumption at this point would be that with all that's been foreshadowed in the past, with all the plot threads that have been left open, would that we would not be introducing an entirely new world. And if it really seems as if we've reached a point where the scope of the story should be beginning to narrow, not widen. And yet here we are. I'm not going to complain except when one takes hiatuses into account. But this story is going to be going on for a very, very long time. And it's already been going on for 15 years, give or take. Surely it'll be a masterpiece when, when, not if, I'm going to be optimistic here, it is finished. It's already fantastic, amazing, magnificent, and just imagining looking back at a finished Hunter Hunter. It's so exciting to me. I just hope it really happens. Tokoshi, make it happen, please. But just as thought, a few things that need to happen, just for fun. So, we need to see Chimera and Kite come into her own. Yes, I mentioned Kite first because I love Kite. We need to see how all the crazy slots there are like, what, nine of them, and we've seen maybe four at most, and how they all work. Especially the one that Jing implied saved Kite's life. Because that's kind of very important to me, if nothing else. I want to see what happened. Uh, Krolo. Krolo needs to have a fight. A real fight. Because apparently he is supposed to be so amazing and powerful. When you think about how excited Hisuga gets about thing about the fight, the possibility of fighting Dancho. You know, and so we have two possibilities here for that. Kurapika versus Krolo and Hisuga versus Krolo. In an ideal world, both of them would happen. I'd like to see both of them happen. But at the end of the day, I do think that Kurapika versus Krolo is far more important two of the stories, so if we had to pick one, it'd be Kurapika versus Carlo, where we see a real fight happen. And my dream here would be, <laughs> at the risk of being pessimistic, would be a Hisoka, no, not Hisoka, would be a Kurapika Krolo double kill. On one hand, Kurapika successfully finishes Krolo off, he succeeds in his quest, but he's also dead as well, so we're kind of going to be left questioning whether it was really worth it all in the end. Yeah, you won, but you're dead. Like, I don't know, it'll be interesting to see. And of course, I would still love to see Hisuka versus Krolo, Hisuka would love to see Hisuka versus Krolo, but we don't know whether it's going to happen. I think that we will definitely see Hisuka versus Gon. That's very narratively important. It's kind of been foreshadowed on the very beginning. That would be funny. It would be very funny if you didn't get a chance to play either of them. Uh, he's just left at the left it, left alone at the end, bored with no one to fight, you know? But I still want to see. Which brings us to another major conflict that was definitely going to have to go down at some point. Kiloa and Kilumi. And the most 
most rational, most the way that makes the most sense to me would be that Iluni somehow does something to Alaga, which would in turn trigger two things. Kilo versus Iluni. This is something that Kilo has always needed to get over. This is all Iluni has always been a stumbling block to Kiloa, so it needs to happen at some point. And also probably something insane with Nanika. We don't understand Nanika at all. And so I think that she is one of those factors that's really going to mess everything up. And I really don't I really don't understand what was come what happened, how it would happen, what would the results be or anything like that. But I think it's a development that's probably going to unfold in some way. Also, what is Gyro? That was a backstory that was so detailed, and it's such a weird point. I still don't know what to make of it, other than that it's probably really important. Ultimately, the Chimera Antarch was something that changed everything story it makes you question everything that you used to know about the plot the world about the characters about whatever and it's so big it's so important and yet it kind of feels at a disconnect with the rest of the story and because of how important it is i don't really think that should be the case and so also i don't believe we've seen the last of this stuff and Gyro would be a very viable option for continuation, along with the very many Chimerians still present in the world, many of which are actually currently under Paristan's control. And so, I believe that after we deal with everything with Corolla, everything with the Phantom Troop, whatever, that Gyro may very well be our endgame antagonist with Pariston's aid. Two men who just want to watch the world burn. On times are coming to the world of Hunter Hunter. And honestly, one of my biggest questions at this point would be how Illumi and Hisuka, aside from the conflicts that I just mentioned, are really going to end up fitting into the grander scheme of things. They're important, yes, they've been important from the very beginning. They're antagonists, yes, but their danger has only ever really been a very personal one, to Kilo and Gon, respectively, of course. And so I can't really see them becoming major arc-length antagonists or anything like that. They're terrible people, they're dangerous people, but they don't really pose a large-scale threat thanks to how narrow their own interests are. And the only thing that I could see with them would be triggering something disastrous with Nanika or something between Kilua and Gon. You'd think that from the beginning of the story they'd be major, major characters that affect everything. But the story has just gotten so huge and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger that that's probably just not the case. So, honestly, all of this speculation is kind of pointless because of that. Even if this is the rough direction the story takes, say, three more arcs, but Dark Continent, we've got Kudapika versus Quill and the Phantom Troop, then we have all that stuff with Gyro and Parasyn at the end, which is a possible format for the rest of the story. There's going to be so much extra stuff in between that it will look so different. Really, the unpredictability of Hunter Hunter is honestly just one of those things that makes it so much fun. I just wanted to put some thoughts out, because what else am I going to do now that I've reached the hiatus? <laughs> so, all faith in Togashi. As long as he comes back. So, see you all soon.